presenter is Dr. Bradley Heckman from the National Cancer Institute. She's joining us virtually today. And uh, her title is Emergent Pharmacologic Interventions Pre for Prevention, Non-Endocrine Treatments. Dr. Heckman, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Arun. Good afternoon. I wanna thank Dr. Arun and the San Antonio organizers for inviting me to present on non-endocrine treatments for prevention. I'm sad to not be there in person for my first oral presentation at San Antonio. I have no disclosures other than the viewpoints presented here are my own and not those of the MCI. For the talk today, I thought I'd give you a brief overview of the ways NCI is currently funding work in prevention, and then move on to discuss a couple classes of non-endocrine agents where there has been significant clinical work. This will include ECGC as an example of nutraceuticals, NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents, as well as HER2 targeted therapy and other immunoprevention strategies. Although my talk on emerging agent, although many talks on emerging agents focus on preclinical work, I'm hoping to galvanize what is a largely clinical audience to help think about and tackle some of the challenges that have arisen in early phase clinical trials. And I hope for a robust discussion with the other panelists. The one thing we always try to balance in prevention are the risks and the benefits. We want to develop agents that are both well tolerated and efficacious. As the risks of the patient population increase, higher risks have been tolerated. But we have to remember that these are healthy people who happen to be at increased risk of cancer. We look to accomplish this through examining differential dosing as well as different routes of administration, which in the breast could be topical or even intralesional administration. NCI funds drug development in cancer prevention and interception through a series of programs. Preclinical work is funded through the PREVENT Preclinical Drug Development Program. Early phase trials have previously been funded through a contract program, but this has been transitioned to a cooperative agreement grant program called the Cancer Prevention Clinical Trials Network, or CPCT-NET. Preclinical and early phase clinical trials are also funded through a robust investigator initiated grant portfolio of R21s and R01s. Our large phase two and phase three trials are funded through the NCI Community Oncology Research Program or NCORE. These studies often compete for additional R01 funding to cover the biomarker costs associated with these trials. PREVENT is the preclinical contract program where you can apply to use NCI resources to move drug development forward through the prevention pipeline. This can include proof of concept testing, testing and additional animal models, as well as CGMP scale up or toxicology if necessary. Your project can enter this pipeline wherever it currently exists. The deadline for the next application is coming up January 10th, 2022 and information on applying to this program can be found at the website below. PREVENT has funded a number of projects related to breast cancer prevention drug development, including supportive endoxygen gel development, examining lower doses of mTOR targeting in animal models, examining rank ligand inhibition in BRCA2 animal models, preclinical development of multi-antigen vaccines for to prevent triple negative breast cancer, and GMP and GLP tox for the Artemis vaccine developed in collaboration with the National Breast Cancer Coalition. I'll highlight a few of the funding opportunities where you can submit investigator initiated work. This includes PAR 2292, our NCI clinical and translational exploratory and developmental studies, preclinical work, as well as biomarker and early phase clinical trials can be submitted through this mechanism. And it includes both cancer treatment and diagnosis, as well as our prevention and symptom management portfolios. Three years ago, there was a major change in NIH funding of clinical trials that required all clinical trials to be submitted through a clinical trial specific funding opportunity announcement. 
NCI does not participate in the parent clinical trials FOA. And so we wrote this specific FOA for cancer prevention and control clinical trials. Over the last three fiscal years, we've funded 125 clinical trials through this FOA. This has included multiple breast cancer prevention studies, including the impact of denosumab on breast density, the effect of Duave on breast cancer risk, the impact of Sulindac on breast density, the effect of 4-hydroxytamoxifen gel on atypical ductal hyperplasia, as well as studies that examine 4-hydroxytamoxifen gel penetrance through irradiated breast. DCP also funds a large portion of our early phase trial portfolio through the network that I mentioned, CPCTNet. Trials are submitted through five lead academic sites, which include University of Arizona, Northwestern, MD Anderson, University of Wisconsin, and Michigan. These sites partner with affiliated organizations across the U.S. and internationally to conduct studies. This network conducted over 45 clinical trials during its last five-year funding cycle, about half of which were focused on breast cancer. The primary goal of this network is to examine preliminary efficacy and safety of agents to qualify them for further development. We also examine clinical trial designs, develop surrogate and intermediate biomarkers, test novel imaging technologies, as well as develop, develop further insights into mechanisms of cancer prevention agents. Finally, we have the phase three clinical trials program run through NCORE. These seven research bases and the network of community and minority underserved community sites reach over a thousand locations across the US. The current prevention studies open through this network include a large phase two study of metformin in high-risk women with cytologic atypia, looking at regression of atypia as the primary endpoint. There are a number of ancillary studies that are examining breast density as a surrogate endpoint for prevention in adjuvant studies, including the aspirin study A011502. Additionally, Dr. Garber has been working to open the BRCA-P study of denosumab in BRCA1 mutation carriers that she mentioned yesterday during her Brinker Award lecture. This is in collaboration with international partners. So let's move on to the classes of non-endocrine agents, starting with nutraceuticals. These studies are often based on epidemiologic associations and are followed by preclinical work that is focused on examining the mechanistic underpinnings of this prevention. Often, the drug levels that are used in these studies cannot be achieved physiologically. There is also challenges that the drug products used in different trials that seemingly examine the same nutraceutical agent are not standardized and thus it's hard to make conclusions across different trials using the same agent. Just because it comes from a plant doesn't mean it isn't toxic. We've had significant challenges with some nutraceutical agents having significant toxicity, including liver toxicity. Finally, as people tried to develop new formulations that may increase the bioavailability, this may require additional toxicology be completed. Let's take a look at one of the largest phase two trials conducted examining the impact of green tea extract on mammographic density in postmenopausal women. This study randomized 1,075 women with 878 women completing intervention. The study was led by Dr. Mindy Kurzer from the University of Minnesota and re was recruited at four sites. The treatment included four capsules of EGCG per day, and there were no significant changes in mammographic density or absolute density in this study. Often, these types of results result in more questions than answers. Let's start with mammographic density as the primary endpoint. Prior to this study, the only agent that had been shown to change mammographic density was tamoxifen. 
because of the association of density change with the impact on breast cancer risk in the IBIS-1 study, mammographic density is discussed as the only validated surrogate endpoint for prevention. However, raloxifene and aromatase inhibitors have not been shown to impact breast density, despite their efficacy in breast cancer risk reduction. Unfortunately, this study did not collect any breast tissue, so there's no tissue available to look at other breast-specific endpoints. Additionally, there are always questions about formulation in these types of studies. So let's take a look at another study that used a different formulation of EGCG. This is a study from Bernardo Bonani's group in Milan that looked at a green select phytosome formulation of EGCG. That's a lectin formulation of a caffeine-free green tea catechin extract. This formulation is in granules that is then suspended in drinkable water. This was a small pre-surgical study that looked at whether or not the drug was getting to the breast. It is important to understand drug concentrations in tissue when thinking about biomarker results and evaluating new drug formulations. So here you can see that total EGCG levels were present in the tumor tissue in the breast at surgery. And there was a correlation in the percent change in KI-67 with the free EGCG levels. Next, let's take a look at NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents, including both celecoxib and Sulindac. Celecoxib is a selective COX-2 inhibitor that was intensely studied in the early 2000s because of the shown increase in expression in COX-2 early in disease progression. There were a number of preclinical studies done, including this one, which showed the impact of celecoxib on tumor multiplicity in the MMTV new mouse model in comparison to control or COX-1 selective inhibitor. There were a number of clinical studies started that were then put on hold because of a black box warning added to the drug label because of a cardiovascular toxicity that was seen in the polyp prevention trial. Some of these studies were closed and not able to complete because of sufficient accrual. However, Dr. Arun recently published her study last year, which unfortunately did not show a change in KI-67. Additionally, this was also true of Dr. Fabian's trial, which was completed and presented at the AACR annual meeting in 2008. The question here is whether or not KI-67 is the right biomarker for an anti-inflammatory agent. Finally, let's take a look at Sulindac. This is a trial that was run by Allison Stopek and Patty Thompson and they presented results from this trial uh, two years ago here at San Antonio in a poster session. And these were published in Clinical Cancer Research in 2001. This study enrolled women taking aromatase inhibitor and looked at the impact of Sulindac on breast density using a fat water ratio MRI technique. This study showed a significant a significant reduction in breast density at both six and 12 months with no significant change in the AI only control group. This is now being followed up with a randomized phase two study focusing on the high risk population. Let's move on to talk about HER2 targeted prevention and immunoprevention, including lapatinib, trastuzumab, and vaccines. So lapatinib is a HER2 EGFR dual targeted agent that's been studied extensively in HER2 overexpressing animal models as a prevention agent. The challenge has been the clinical translation into prevention as we don't have a risk model specifically for HER2 positive breast cancer. These studies have focused on HER2 positive DCIS as a target population. Here we show work from Andrea DeCenzi and Bernardi Bonani's group in Milan, where they conducted a pre-surgical window of opportunity trial in early stage breast cancer patients, which showed a significant reduction in KI-67. 
They also have looked at KI-67 in the surrounding in situ and hyperplasia, showing differences at surgery and placebo between the lapatinib and placebo-treated groups. Other studies have also looked at the impact of lapatinib pre-surgically in both early stage breast cancer as well as DCIS. Unfortunately, the accrual to the DCS trials have been challenged by the fact that HER2 staining at biopsy is not part of standard of care and thus accruing to these HER2 positive DCIS tri trials is incredibly challenging. However, with a small sample size, a study of low dose Lapatinib was able to show reductions in KI-67, even, but there were still challenges with toxicity. And so if these agents are to move forward in prevention, we really need to figure out how to give it in a way that minimizes the toxicity while maintaining the benefit. Here I show the results from B43, which was a comparison of radiation with or without two doses of trastuzumab during radiation for women who had previous surgery for HER2 positive DCIS. This gets around that issue I was talking about of needing that HER2 positivity at biopsy as this was a post-surgical study. So this study was based on a power calculation to examine a 36% decrease in ipsilateral breast tumor recurrence. And here you can see that these lines do separate, but the hazard ratio was 0.81. And so this trial was not positive given the way the study was powered. And so if this were to move forward, we need to think about what is the true effect size that we would be willing to accept and, and potentially do a second trial. Maybe additional doses of, are needed. Let's move on to vaccines where uh, Brian Zernecki has pioneered work with the HER2 pulse dendritic cell vaccine. He's completed a series of studies, including a pre-surgical intranodal weekly injections, four injections, where uh, N of 13 showed increased antigen-specific interferon gamma secreting CD4 positive and CD8 positive T cells. A second pre-surgical study, which uh, enrolled 27 women, where at surgery, five of those 27 women who had been vaccinated had no evidence of remaining disease, while among the 22 women with residual DCIS, the HER2 expression was eradicated in half. Finally, he compared the way the vaccination was given, either intralesional, intranodal, or both intralesional and intranodal, and showed that the site of injection uh, did, was not associated with response. The challenge with this type of vaccine is that the process for making the vaccine is very complicated, requiring leukophoresis, and then activating those dendritic cells and giving them back to the woman as a vaccination. This is challenging to scale up, moving from single site studies as uh, Dr. Zanecki has previously done into multi-site and potentially international trials to get this to an approvable um, pathway. So one way to get around this is to think about either peptide or plasmid-based vaccines also targeting HER2. This was a phase two trial of Nelly Pepamute S peptide vaccine that's given in combination with uh, GMCSF called NuVax. This was a study run by Dr. Beth Mittendorf through our MD Anderson consortium that compared NuVax to uh, GMCSF alone. The study required HLA2 positivity because this is a short peptide but it did enroll all DCIS patients, regardless of HER2 status, um, to get around this issue of HER2 testing prior at biopsy. This study was presented here in San Antonio in a poster session previously, and the vaccine was well tolerated. However, there were no significant differences in cytologic T cell response between women treated with NuVax versus GMCSF alone. 
the vaccine was given in two weekly injections prior to surgery, so there may not have been sufficient time to mount an immune response. And I'll also note that the numbers in this trial were very small because of challenges with the drug supply. Finally, we've been examining multi-antigen pep, uh, peptide vaccines that uh, for the purposes of clinic were converted to a plasmid-based vaccine. In the preclinical work, they are peptides. So here, this is the preclinical work for WalkVac, which is named after the philanthropic organization that provided funding to make the vaccines for the clinical trials called Wings of Karen. Here you can see that individually, the different antigens have some effect on uh, tumors within the MMTV new animal mice, but given as a multi-antigen vaccine, this is really a significant decrease in, in cancer development in this animal model. This includes antigens HER2, IGF-BP2, and IGF-1R. You can also see that pr providing the mice with vaxeratine to slow down this animal model has a very significant impact on the ability of the vaccine to work, giving it time to mount an immune response and really reduce the term, tumor burden in this animal model. So we've recently completed a phase one dose escalation study examining the immune response and are now thinking through the lessons learned from other HER2 positive DCIS studies to think about how we continue the drug development in this space. So let me finish with a call to action. There are many studies that are ongoing where we can continue to learn about trial design and conduct, as well as the preliminary efficacy of agents. But, and there are also programs such as the Pre-Cancer Atlas where we can think about new targets for non-endocrine agents. But the real need is to enhance the work is better risk models for determining population selection for studies and work on validating biomarkers. We don't want to disqualify a potential prevention agent because it doesn't change a biomarker that was developed based on our endocrine prevention agents. With that, I wanna invite you to connect with us at the Division of Cancer Prevention. We're two weeks away from the 50th anniversary of the National Cancer Act. And Dr. Sharpless, the director of the NCI and his remarks to the National Cancer Advisory Board earlier today highlighted that our current president has a goal to end cancer as we know it, and discussed what that means, including finding new ways to prevent cancer so our work continues. You can find information about the programs I discussed on the DCP website, as well as follow us on Twitter to learn more about the new funding opportunities when they're announced. Thank you, Dr. Hickman, thank you.